안녕하십니까 이지원 치과의 손영희입니다. Greetings, I'm Dr. s o n y o n g i of e g o o Dental Clinic. Today I want to talk about management and prevention of maxillary sinus surgery related complications. The complications of sinus graft can largely be divided into two intraoperative and postoperative complications. Let's look at intraoperative complication. Most notably, there is sinus membrane perforation followed by intraoperative bleeding, improper bone graft, and residual alveolar ridge fracture, which can occur upon drilling. If you look at postoperative complication, the most notable complication is postoperative pain and swelling and sinus infection. Also, implant displacement can occur, osseo integration failure as well as vital bone formation failure can occur. The complications that occur intraoperatively. The most frequent complication is a bleeding and perforation. Let's look at bleeding first. If you look at the intraosseous anastomosis and extraosseous anastomosis, there can be damage to intraosseous anastomosis artery, resulting in bleeding. The reason why we damage intraosseous anastomosis artery more than extraosseous anastomosis artery is because extraosseous anastomosis. Is included in the flap that is reflected, as shown. Unless you make excessive uh, vertical incision, it is not easy to damage extraosseous anastomosis artery. It is reflected, as shown. In the case of intraosseous anastomosis artery, it can exist within sinus or in the form of canal within bone. As for extraosseous anastomosis artery, damages can occur upon a flap reflection. Upper branch can be damaged. When forming lateral window, intraosseous anastomosis artery can be damaged frequently. So this kind of damage occurs much more frequently. As for extraosseous anastomosis artery, unless we make a very significant vertical incision. It is included within flap, so it is not frequently damaged. As a result, it is very important not to make such a significant vertical incisions to prevent damaging extraosseous anastomosis artery. I am reminding you that the intraosseous anastomosis artery can be damaged quite frequently, and damages occur most frequently when lateral windows are formed. And this is the primary cause of intraoperative bleeding. This is the primary cause. Depending on how we form window. Whether we come across intraosseous anastomosis artery is determined. At times, inevitably, intraosseous anastomosis artery is included within the window. As you can see, intraosseous anastomosis artery can be observed. If you can see it, that's best. Intraosseous anastomosis artery can be divided into the following five types. Type one is a case where intraosseous anastomosis artery runs within the lateral wall of the sinus, and when less than half a circle is impacted into the bone. In this case, there is less possibility of damage. Type two, this is a case where intraosseous anastomosis artery runs within the lateral wall of the sinus. With more than half circle impacted into the bone, this is quite risky as well. Type three, it looks like a canal within the bone. Type four, it is exterior to the lateral wall, and type five, it completely penetrates the bone. These three categories are deemed risky. Type two is quite risky as well. As shown, if there's half a circle, if you form window carefully, then it's not going to be a problem. But if it is a bony canal type, or if it is fully penetrated, like type five, if the artery runs like this, then it is prone to damage. We need to check these kind of situations on CT carefully if it can be observed. If possible, window needs to be formed below that. 
However, as mentioned in the previous lecture on CT, you can only see intraosseous anastomosis artery half the time. There can be cases where you cannot see it, and you need to bear this in mind as you perform surgery. Let's look at uh, arterial bleeding. There are three different risk patterns in terms of intraosseous anastomosis artery. We need to look at running pattern and size of intraosseous anastomosis artery as well as the level of vertical alveolar bone resorption. These are the risks. As shown, in most cases, intraosseous anastomosis artery runs as straight. However, about 20 to 22 percent of the time, it shows U-shaped pattern. In this case, you need to be very careful in forming window. The running pattern is very important. In general, when window is formed, it is done like this. It needs to be formed 2 to 3 millimeters apart from the anterior margin and the floor. The posterior side should match the implant placement depths. The vertical height should be about 5 to 7 millimeters. You need to do it like this. If there is intraosseous anastomosis artery, you need to avoid it and determine the vertical position of the window. Second is running pattern. If you take a look, at times it exists within bone and you need to detach it and elevate it with the membrane, then there will be no problem. Next, I want to talk about the size of anastomosis artery size. In general, posterior superior alveolar artery has mean diameter of 1.3 plus minus 0.5 millimeters. However, the variation level is very significant. At times, the diameter can exceed 2 millimeters, and this is quite frequent. The reports say this. In most cases, it is less than 2 millimeters in diameter. If you take a look at the clinical images, the artery is very thin here, but you can see here that it has a very significant trunk. If you look at the size of the artery, the bigger the size, uh, the risk of bleeding severity may increase. Third, we need to look at the vertical alveolar bone resorption. The risk can vary depending on it. If there is significant resorption, the window position goes up. In this case, there is higher percentage of coming across artery. Depending on the amount of elevation, the risk of bleeding may vary. In the case of a ridge with extreme resorption, the risk of bleeding can increase. You need to bear this in mind as you perform surgery. When there is bleeding, how can we address it? First, we can apply pressure. You apply pressure for about 5 to 10 minutes. You use a Vaseline gauze and apply pressure. You do not apply direct pressure, but you close flap and apply pressure in order to prevent damage to sinus membrane. In most cases, the bleeding stops after 3 to 5 minutes of pressure. You can use clamp or tie if the artery is fully intrabony. Practically speaking, I think we may not be able to use tie and it's better to use clamp. You can also use hemostatic agent and electrocauterization. Personally speaking, I do not recommend electrocauterization. Pressure is used most frequently. Once bleeding occurs, the primary method we can apply is to apply pressure. You can also use clamp. Hemostat or Kelly can be used. Hemostat can be used to stop bleeding in the proximal part where bleeding occurs. We clamp the posterior portion because 
artery runs like this, so we need to clamp here. There's no meaning in using clamp on this side. You need to apply pressure, and if you do bone compression, bleeding may stop. However, I do not think you need to use such aggressive methods. In most cases, bleeding stops within 5 minutes when pressure is applied, and as bleeding stops, collateral circulation occurs, so bleeding stops in most cases. So bone compression is done like this. Next, we can use hemostat. The most frequently used option is Bosman. This is epinephrine diluted to about a thousand. This is a vasoconstrictor and we need to be careful in cardiovascular disease patients. So you do not directly apply it, you use gauze. Soak it and then use it to, to apply pressure. Next option is surgery cell. This is oxidized cellulose with a bactericidal effect. If you widen it, it's like a cloth. When it becomes in contact with blood, it, the blood clots very quickly. You cut it and then you apply it in the bleeding point and apply pressure. If there is oozing or if the area of bleeding is wide, you position it and then apply pressure. Next is bone wax. If there is bone bleeding, you can use this. You do not use bone wax for soft tissue bleeding. This is a wax form which is combination of bee wax and Vaseline. You need to use a very small amounts. This is something we need to bear in mind. If there is bone bleeding, you put it in, rub it. You remove all excess amounts. You need to use smallest amount possible. Next, fibrin glue can be used to stop bleeding. As we all know, it consists of thrombin and fibrinogen, so it induces blood clotting very quickly. Not just bleeding control, but because of its own characteristic, it also supports wound healing. These can be used for control. Next, I want to talk about sinus membrane perforation, which occurs most frequently. Any dentist performing sinus surgery continues to come across uh, membrane perforation. If you look at literature, the possibility of sinus membrane perforation is about 7 to 35 percent or 14 to 56 percent. It's very prevalent. This is a very common complication. Depending on different journal, the level of incidence uh, is different. When does sinus perforation occur? When burr is used directly, perforation may occur. Also, there can be such potential when there's infracture or removal of lateral wall. When a membrane is detached, there is also potential of perforation. When drilling is done or when bone grafting is done, membrane perforation can occur as well. What is most common is this part. When a membrane is elevated because of irregularity in sinus floor or because of septum, or perhaps there can be mistakes in terms of tools usage, so perforation can occur. Let's look at a case where sinus membrane perforation occurs because of direct usage of burr. The burr should not go in in right angle. It should go in diagonally in order to avoid these problems. When detaching membrane, if there's irregularity here or if the tool is not in contact with bone, membrane can be perforated when drilling is done. If membrane is incompletely detached, this can happen. In order to avoid this kind of situation, I prefer to do grafting first before doing drilling. This is rare, but it does occur. 
when you use a large particle bone graph material, because of the sharpness of the large particle, membrane can be damaged and later words, membrane perforation can occur. This does occur quite frequently. Therefore, it is not recommended to use large particle bone graft material in sinus. Risk factors of sinus membrane perforations. It can be more prone for perforation if it is thin. Absence of alveolar bone. This can cause sinus membrane perforation because uh, there can be adhesion between sinus membrane and oral mucosa and as you detach it, perforation can occur. Moving on to sinus floor condition, there can be sinus septum or irregularity. In this case, then the possibility of perforation can increase if the lateral wall is too thick to form window or if the amount of prep required is significant, probability of membrane perforation also increases. When there is sinus pathology or if the patient smokes, the such possibility can increase as well. In order to prevent membrane perforation, what should we do? First, we need to do a great job in designing lateral window. I want to emphasize this over and over again. You need to ensure masticatory function, but you need to make it small, two to three millimeters from the anterior margin and the sinus floor. The height should be about five to seven millimeters. The anteroposterior distance should be about 10 to 15 millimeters. The final posterior margin should be in line with the implant placement depths. This should be your lateral window design. If it is too high, then the instruments will have to go in towards the lower side, leading to higher possibility of perforation. If it is too distal, then you need to go anterior significantly, so there can be more perforation on the anterior side. If it is too small because of the lack of space where instruments can go in, there's higher possibility of membrane perforation. Use of tool is very important. In the case of sinus curette, there is wide one and small blade. You need to use both. You need to use both in turn to be able to detach the sinus membrane smoothly. Accessibility is very important. The tip size of the curette, if you use the wide one from the beginning, it can be a problem. So you need to start with a small one first. You also need to consider the tip size as you perform the surgery. When we classify membrane perforation, we call perforation of less than 5 mm as a small perforation and a perforation of over 5 mm as a large perforation. Where is it most difficult to repair? In the case of anterior perforation, this is considered most difficult to follow by posterior, anterior, middle, and superior. The easiest part is superior because this is not an issue, so to speak. Depending on where perforation occurs, the level of difficulty may vary. Let's talk about small perforation of less than 5 millimeters. At times, so you may not need to do anything, or you can use a tissue adhesive, PRP or PRF, to do repair. You can use resorbable membrane as well. There are different ways to manage your membrane perforation. You can do window or use resorbable membrane or do suture. At times, if you just ignore it, it, it can fold itself and it, it may block naturally. Then you can just ignore it and proceed with graft and procedure, but such probability is extremely slim. We need to do repair. In most cases, collagen membrane is used for repair. We need to check whether sealing is done properly before doing graft but it is not easy to do so, clinically speaking. In the case of tissue adhesive, uh, we can use it for repairing small perforation personally. I don't think this is cost-effective. 
Use of fibrin or a fibrinogen, they're fine, but using tissue adhesive, you may need to think it over. PRP or PRF can be used as well for repair. The most frequently used method is to use a resorbable membrane to do repair. Physical repair will give you peace of mind. When you do membrane repair, the first precondition is that you need to isolate the perforated area. If it is on the inside or if you cannot see it, you will not be able to do repair. First, you need to form window more bigger so that you can isolate the perforated area. That is most important. And then you can proceed with the, the repair process. As shown, there's perforation. You can see that it's not attach the bone and they're fully elevated so you can start repair work. However, we need to approach it cautiously. When there is small perforation as shown, if you manage it to wrong, then it can advance into large perforation. This can occur very frequently so we need to pay a lot of attention. In the case of large perforation, you need to do repair. The most frequently used membrane is to use a resorbable membrane for repair. In the case of uh, suture, this may be possible if the membrane is thick, but I would not recommend you to attempt it. Don't do it. Rather than that, just to do delayed approach, you, you should wait six to eight weeks and then uh, do surgery again. First, use of resorbable membrane to repair large perforation, the precondition is that you need to cover the perforated area. The membrane should cover the entire site. Among collagen membrane rather than a soft membrane, it is better to use a rigid material for space maintenance. In this case, it is better to use rigid cross-linking membrane or alloplastic membrane. When you do repair using membrane, the stability of membrane is very important. If it is bent, then you will not be able to manage perforated area properly and graft materials can go into the sinus. Hence, when addressing a large perforation with resorbable membrane, membrane stability is most important. The most frequently used repair method is tenting technique. There is Loma Linda Pouch technique and membrane fixation using micro pin. In the case of Loma Linda Pouch technique, you will not be able to place implant at the same time. That is the downside. A tenting technique is used most frequently. Hinge is made as shown. You cut it. And here, this side goes into the sinus, and on the other side, it is placed like this. This is uh, the way it's used. The size of this is about 3 to 5 millimeters larger than the perforated area. When you use tentic technique, you use it like this. You reverse it and use it. You fold it and it goes in. When there is perforation, you isolate the perforated area and make a hinge. The hinge portion is positioned here in the sinus window. You make sure that it does not go in further and below that you position the graft materials. This is how it is. It goes in like this, and this area is positioned over here. And here, it comes out like this. This was how surgery was closed.
You can see the case closed like this. Resorbable membrane can be used to repair large perforation and this is the most common way to do it. I want to emphasize once again that membrane stability is very important in membrane repair. How can we stabilize membrane? This is a very important question. You can use pin for repair. The patient experienced a failure of sinus surgery from a different dental clinic. In the past, you can see incomplete bone regeneration and as shown, there is a bit of damage on the lateral wall as well. If you take a look over here, there is a lateral wall loss. On the sinus floor, you can see these kind of irregularities. That's why I assumed that membrane perforation could not be avoidable and it did perforate. Collagen membrane was used. Lateral wall of the sinus was utilized. A pin was used to fixate the membrane. Stabilization was done. Stability was provided. Bone graft was done. And as shown, surgery was closed. If you want to make a perfect dome shape, then you can add a pin to the medial wall and fixate it. However, in this case, medial wall was not utilized and bone graft was done. As shown, implant was placed and it was completed. Using suture for repair, personally, I've never tried it, but there was a case that Dr. Kim Yong Jin shared with me that involved the suturing the perforated membrane. You can do this if the sinus membrane is very thick. The last method is to do delayed method. You just wait if there is a large perforation and if there is complex septa, then you can do septoplasty and wait for healing. You make it flat and after flat reflection when you detect the sinus infection. And if it is difficult to repair using resorbable membrane, then you can just close off. There are issues, however, after waiting about six to eight weeks or two months, then you can get another chance at doing sinus surgery. There are issues when membrane perforation occurs. However, at times membrane does not perforate. Then is membrane perforation a risk factor? Opinions vary. Some authors have reported that membrane perforation was associated with an increased failure rate, whereas most recent studies say that adequately repaired perforations have no effect on the survival of implants. It has no effect on the survival rate. If you take appropriate actions, the sinus membrane perforation does not affect implant survival. If we address and repair membrane perforation, this is not going to be an issue. The precondition is that we need to appropriately repair the perforated sinus membrane. You can utilize pin for stabilization or resorbable membrane. What is appropriate membrane repair necessary for? I've mentioned that membrane stability is most important in repair. By doing appropriate repair of sinus membrane, you can contain sinus graft materials. By doing repair, you can prevent micromobility of graft materials or leakage of such. Once we achieve graft containment, graft stability can be gained, leading to better bone regeneration. That is why membrane stability is most important. Please bear this in mind. After membrane repair, if things turn out unfavorably, if you take a CT and confirm failure, it can lead to infection. In other words, a sinusitis can occur and failure of vital bone formation can result. Because of these, implant failures can result.